My name is Catherine Jones. I work in architectural glass for public buildings principally. Um, sometimes I do make stained glass, uh, traditional stained glass, but mostly it's screen printed large scale glass um, for buildings. And I live and work in Wales in a small peninsula, Gower Peninsula, um, in a rural location. And my studio is in a field and um, yeah, it's a really nice place to be. My workspaces have really changed <laughs> through sort of through my career, I suppose, in that, you know, um, I started out in a big studio with um, sharing with other artists, which was great. Um, and then when that didn't work, you know, I needed to, to move on and work solo, went into a very small studio with, with you know, sort of things, that, benches that I could move around and build according to what I was doing. And I found that this has been a really, this has been a sort of pattern. So if I have a large commission, I take on a bigger space. And then followed by not so much work, perhaps, small space. So my workspace has always been pretty flexible. I never wanted to carry a big space with equipment that I need to fund because I think it's really important to, to sort of stay agile, really, because what's important to me is to continue to work and not to have to compromise what I'm doing creatively in order to maintain a building. Um, so luckily for me in Swansea, there have always been facilities that I could use. So if I need a big kiln, maybe I could rent one from the, from the college or a commercial sandblaster from another glazier. Um, so, you know, it's been good to be flexible. And I suppose because I work on a large scale, I could never, have the sort of equipment that I would need to, to make big scale pieces of work anyway. So my current workspace is, is pretty small. I, what should we call it? Snug, perhaps? Compact? Um, but it's flexible. So if I need to move a bench or if I need to expand, I can do that. Or, um, you know, move some things out to get rid of some clutter. Um, and it, I suppose in some ways, the actual studio has become less important to me. Early in my career, it was really important that I you know, really wanted a nice studio, a sort of something that looked professional. But now I, you know, I think because I work quite a lot um, digitally, this, I see the studio as a kind of experimental box really. So it's a space that holds my pens and pencils and you know, things that I don't really need, but I like to have around me. So it's that sort of, it's that kind of inspiration. It's where you come to concentrate, that's not the house. But I'm actually pretty good at blocking out everything else when I need to work. You know, I don't need to do the washing up or any of those things, just ignore all of that and get my head down. So I suppose it's concentration here, but its surroundings are important. So, you know, I've always worked, that's, I suppose I've always drawn inspiration from what's around me, like a lot of artists do, landscape, light, um, you know, what's happening, movement in the, in the, in the sort of small things and the big things, the sky, what that's doing. And, you know, seasonality, I suppose, is so important. So because I'm in a rural location now, that is ever present, how everything is shifting and changing. And before that, I was working, when I lived in Swansea City, I was looking over the sea a lot. So everything sort of got, got blue and yellow for a while, which I only realised later. It was that sort of influence of, of where, where I was that was sort of creeping in, really. Got a bit more green going on now, oddly. <laughs> so, yeah. So I work for public buildings. Well, I hope to work for public buildings and um, it's what I've done for the past 30 years now. Um, I decided to, you know, quite early in my career to focus on making stained glass for, for places rather than making small scale objects. Um, and so I suppose that sort of influences the way that I actually work with the material because it means that I work for large scale um, uh, buildings. Um, in the early days, I did all of this using traditional stained glass methods, um, but I 
quickly had to adapt what I was doing according to the equipment that I had in my studio at the time, which was really a very small studio and um, just an acid etching facility. So I like to, I would like etching anyway. It's a, it's a, it's a practice that a lot of people, you know, are quite worried about and rightly so, but um, I decided to specialise in that, which, but that allowed me to make very gestural painterly marks onto large pieces of glass, which would mean that I could pair back my lead line, which, you know, in a traditional stained glass window, there are small pieces of glass and lots of lead, whereas I was aiming to use large pieces of glass and not very much lead. Um, so, but then as time has gone on, practice has changed and technique like screen printing has become more prominent. Now I have, I guess, in some ways less contact, physical contact with glass, but more contact with looking at colour, how that works on a large scale, how it's printed, how it's um, various different ways of printing, um, whether you're using two sides of glass, three sides of glass, silvers and you know other sorts of techniques that can really enhance what you're doing according to the budget that you have. So I think you know scale has been a really important thing in my work uh, partly because when I trained at Swansea College of Art in the 80s I had to think when that was then. Um, we were we were taught by some of the great German masters who were working, contemporary artists who were working in stained glass at the time, and they were making really large scale pieces of stained glass, very very ambitious pieces, which were the whole sides of buildings. So it really, I think it it may it helped me to understand scale, and also sort of. I suppose gave me an ambition really to to try to achieve you know something like that in this country um you know the germans were working largely for for churches uh, post war um but when i started my practice public art was just starting to be a thing here and so the government was putting money into its public buildings um which was just fantastic and perfect timing for me because i you know i i just sort of graduated, come through a sort of studio practice which had taught me a lot about you know how, how to how to work and how to um, how to budget for things and then I was commissioned to do big scale pieces so it was never a thing that I was frightened about it was always an ambition to work on a large scale I think just because glass has the most incredible capacity really to change the interior to tell a story to animate its space to really, really make somewhere so inspirational that, you know, you would not want to go anywhere else but a building that's that's decorated by contemporary glass. So I uh, studied at Swansea College of Art, I went there first in 1978 to a foundation course. Um, I did not know where I was going on that year. But it was a year that really gave me a lovely sort of broad training. Um, and right at the end, I found something that was to do with colour and pattern and in three dimensions. So I attempted to deconstruct a, an Islamic pattern and then make it in space, which I did with Perspex. Um, and at that point, I thought, oh, how can I apply this? Oh, I'll, I'll go and work in glass, hot glass. But luckily for me, I actually wasn't accepted onto the hot glass course in Stourbridge. I think I just wasn't right for it. Um, and so I thought again and discovered the course that was happening in Swansea, applied and was lucky enough to, to be accepted. And at that time, it was, it was a really great course to be part of. It had an international um, intake in terms of the students who studied there and an international outlook, um, which which I was really excited about because I quite honestly had thought that stained glass was like oh, a bit boring. And my 18 year old self didn't really want to do something that was traditional. But of course, when I started to understand, you know, what contemporary glass was, which was a very graphic big scale artwork, something incredibly dynamic and pertinent to our own times, 
then of course you know I was off and so um, but also what was interesting was that we were trained in traditional stained glass making um, so that encompassed heraldry um, cartooning glass painting looking at medieval glass um, so you know we, we had a really good historical background um, through to contemporary glass and then we were also um, taught by all the major uh, artists who were working in Europe at the time so we kind of we knew where the medium had come from and where it was and at the fact that it had a contemporary um, application I suppose so you know a lot of ambition and there were a lot of all the students were it was fierce competition on our course so you know you didn't want to sort of take a holiday really you needed to work hard so it was a really exciting place to be at the time yeah when I left college in 1982 um, I was lucky because I had been commissioned whilst I was still a student so it did give me some confidence that I could actually practice stained glass um, it was always my plan just to to, to be a stained glass artist as much as possible um, but I was also lucky in that at the time there were a group of five students who and we were set, uh, setting up a studio uh, that was called Glasslight Studios um, we set up as a cooperative so you know we all put a bit of money in and um, Swansea City Council supported us um, at that time they were trying to create an arts quarter down where the marina is in Swansea which is you know had been a derelict site for a long time and it was being rejuvenated and so the idea was to have Swansea Arts Quarter there there was a gallery there there were studios there and we were there so we set up our studio and we worked as I said as a cooperative and we kind of continued to to sort of do what we'd done at college so that if a, um, a commission came in we would each present designs for it and try to sort of to gain <laughs> gain the commission of um, but it was, and then we would help one another actually make the commission. Um, and the other thing was is that the the it, we were supported by um, Welsh Arts Council, who provided um, equipment for us. So we had kilns, sand blasters, uh, acid bay. So it was all there. And the idea was that as students left the university or the college at that time, they would be able to step out and use our facility. So it, there would be an ongoing support for students who were making glass within the city. So the idea was to try to keep glass artists in Swansea and able to work because the, the equipment was there. Um, so that I stayed with Glasslight Studios for five years and then for me it wasn't working because I wasn't really able to do the creative work that I wanted to do. At that point I was sort of shifting from being content to be a sort of jobbing glass glazier I suppose you know where we would we would do anything we would fix leaded lights we would sandblast things we made commissions for other other bigger studios we did sort of piecework um, but I really wanted to work as an artist and I really wanted to do my own work so I stepped out and I took a much smaller space and I took my work to a craft fair at that time it was called Crafts in Action, which was in St Donuts. I did not make any small things, but I took photographs of the work that I had made whilst I was a student. And I was lucky enough to be commissioned. So that got me going. So I had a commission and I was able to keep my studio going. Um, but the other thing I did was that I worked with uh, Amber Hiscott and David Pearl, who also had a studio in, in just across the road at that time and they were making glass for public buildings so I worked as a studio assistant for them and I actually learned an awful lot from them and you know how to approach public work and so it was you know it was a it was a really nice place to be at the time and it, lots of students who came out of college did that they would go work in a studio and you know lots of exciting things happened. I mean, you know, I, I just talked about how I started off and um, I had a, an amazing year. 1991 was my amazing year because I was commissioned to do two big public um, pieces of artwork at that time. And 
you know, it was there. I had never made anything of that scale before. Um, and I remember sort of practicing how to deliver the budget because I was really scared about how much money it was going to cost. Um, but actually, it, it was those two things were, were sort of what started my career really. One was for a um, sheltered housing project in Splot in Cardiff, and the other one was for the Lyceum Theatre in Sheffield. And they were both made with traditional stained glass using large scale techniques, acid etching and leading actually, which, you know, now, you know, it'd be really hard to do that for a public building, I think. Um, so, and then what I did was I sort of continued on that, you know, doing various pieces of work. And I suppose when, you, uh, when you're working day to day, you're, the highlight is the thing you're working on at the time. <laughs> And then you finish that and, you know, you're, you're always looking forward to whatever the next thing is going to be. But I suppose, you know, rather than list the pieces that I've done, the, the highlight for me recently was working for Grange Hospital, um, which, is, which is a new hospital in Gwent in Wales, which was, has been a really fantastic project because it, it sort of re-wound back to the days when artists would be brought in early on in the design process. And, you know, you, uh, the, what you did was then it would then inform the rest of the work at, for the whole hospital. So that has been a really fantastic piece. And that was five um, waiting room screens um, on five different floors, um, looking at Gwent and its incredible um, scenery and its, its landscape, I suppose. So for me to be able to champion Wales and landscape and make some stained glass, in a hospital for, for people for where everyone can see it. It was a really special thing, so yeah. Okay, so when I start a project, well, there's, there's a few phases. There's apply for the project, get really excited about that, pray that you get it, and then when you do get it, there's this fantastic elation, followed by fear. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh God, now I've got to do it. Um, so the, there are those things. But then, I mean, for me, it's really important that my work is, is site, well, it is always site specific. Um, so my working practice will be to go and um, thoroughly research the site, um, take lots of photographs, walk, uh, paint, draw. Um, go to the library. <laughs> so we do a lot of research. Um, I don't ever have a preconception of what it is I'm going to do. Um, uh, so it'll be uh, gathering lots and lots and lots of information. Um, as I say, sometimes it's photographic, sometimes it's drawn, sometimes it's everything. Um, and then I'll kind of go through a long period of sort of sifting I often walk. I find walking is really useful when I'm designing, um, just because it helps me actually think when I'm walking along. And there's this sort of, there's a time element as well. I think a lot of creatives talk about this, where you sort of, you put it to the back of your head and you have it sort of cooking in the sort of peripheral <laughs> round, round here somewhere. So you're thinking about it, but you're not thinking about it. And I often find that if I've got a sort of design problem or I'm not sure I'm going, if I walk or do something else, I'll, something will, you know, a way through will come. And then um, what I'll do is I'll get all of that information into the digital zone um, and I'll start to, you know, draw, draw up my building, my space, understand what that space is, think about the light, um, all of the constraints that I have to consider. Sometimes I might build a model if I'm really struggling with how the work is going to impact the building then I will make a model uh, or sometimes I'll do some design work and then I'll put it into a model. Um, but it's a lot of sort of push and pull I suppose where you put things in and then you take them out and then you expand them, you shrink them, turn them multiply them. So in lots of ways I'm replicating what I used to do with paper. So back in days of lovely paper, which sometimes I could do go back to, um, I worked with collage because I found that collage was a really good way to show what stained glass looked like and I would work in lots of layers or I would photocopy uh, flat colours, just colour layers and then overlap them, shift them. 
which also echoes printing. You know, if you think about a slightly mis mismatched print. For me, that is very light glass, so I really, you know, I'll now replicate that um, in the in the sort of in Photoshop or something, um, and then I'll go back to printing it out, looking at it, making it a bit bigger, standing back. You know, there's a lot of sort of cogitating <laughs> really, um, and then once the design is more or less settled, you know, that I'll, I'll, I'll have to work in series as well, actually. So I'll do not one design, but maybe five, six, depending, which means that I can chuck out a lot of, you know, first ideas are sometimes hopeless. Sometimes it's that one. So go through all of that. Um, and then when, when that sort of pinned down, we get into the glass area. So that would then be looking at how the work is going to be translated. And that's then there's an awful lot going on there. It's not a simple matter. I, you know, I hear this thing that um, stained glass is required for a public building and no experience is required. Well, that's not right <laughs> because it's a really complicated pro process getting to know what works when you print something at a large scale and how the light is going to interact with that. And also all the other nuances that you can achieve building in maybe animation or uh, texture or you know stopping the light with a, with a shadow or with a, some opacity. So there's a, an awful lot that goes on when I work with my studio, which is usually Proto Studios. Um, they're specialist screen printers and I've, I work with them because I've worked with them for a long time and we now understand one another's language which also takes a, quite a long time to sort of establish. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we work with a German glass studio too but that would depend on what the medium is. If it's printing I'll work with Proto, if it's um, airbrush work or stained glass work I'd work with a German studio. So then you're sampling, we do lots of samples. There are lots of ways to translate and, the, you know, when my first discussions with the studio, he'll say, oh, we'll do it this way. And I'm saying, no, I don't see it like that at all. You know, I need to see it in transparent. I need to see it in opaque. I need to see it using these colour combinations. So all of those things play out. And then we look at the samples and decide what the best way to go is for the sample. Just keep on like that, really, until everybody's happy with what we've got and then I'll show those to the client and um, so that because that really helps clients understand what they're actually going to get at the end of the day which you know is is important and quite hard to translate when you're just looking from the sort of paper or a digital design on into actual glass work. I've always found in my creative career that I just I just need to be sort of open and I need maybe not to be too concerned about whether or not I'll get another commission. Because <laughs> there always is that worry. It's like, you know, are you resting or are you working? There's a kind of, you know, you can get into a sort of state of panic thinking, Ooh, that's it, there's no more work around. Um, so I guess my aspiration is always to make, you know, some really phenomenally large piece of glass work for a really wonderful public building. So that's, but you know, that th th these are, it, I'm sort of subject to economics. If, if there's one drawback to being a commissioned artist, it's that you have to be commissioned in order to work. Because I don't really want to make small things that have nowhere to go. I think, you know, we do have to think about the planet and I've got, I've got lots of pieces of glass that I've gathered through my career, but I don't really want to make any more things that don't have homes. So what I might aspire to is to continue to, to grow, continue to be open in my approach. And that usually brings something. Um, for instance, at the moment, I'm working with concrete, which is not plan and is, is a little bit, you know, it's very different to glass working. But I think it's that sort of staying agile is, is what I like to try to do, really. So the short answer to your question is I don't have a plan. Um, and see what comes.